So I'm going to uh, talk to you today. I'm going to share some observations today about what it is the world's most innovative people do differently than everybody else. And I'm going to give you some techniques, I think, for how we can be more like them. Um, to start this off, though, I want to tell you a story. Um, I was in charge of a five-year-old for the day. Um, and <laughs> so I, after a staring contest, first of all, that I somehow lost, I don't know how she got me to back down, she won the staring contest, said, what are we going to do today? I said, I've got to go to my office. I said, get in the car. So she starts walking across the room, and she's looking down as she's walking, and she says to me, how do they make carpet? And I said, I, I don't know, there's machines that sew it and stitch it together, whatever, just get in the, go to the garage, right? So we're walking along, we get in the garage, and she goes over to the car, she taps on the window, and she says, how do they make glass? And I said, I don't know, there's like fire and sand? And she's like, <laughs> fire and sand? She's given me this look like, remind me not to waste my money on a Yale education. And I'm like, it's seriously, that's how they make glass. Get in the car, OK? Then she taps on that thing you see, the bar that goes between the two windows. And she says, what is this thing called? And I said, it doesn't have a name. And she said, what is the thing between the two windows, this strip called? I said, it doesn't have a name, OK? And she said, if it doesn't have a name, how do they order more on the assembly line? <laughs> OK, so it's five-year-old three, old guy nothing at this point. I said, look, just get in the car. So we get in the car, and we drive to the office. When we get to the office, I am walking across my familiar territory through my familiar employees and processes. And there she goes again. I look, and I watch in her eyes. She's looking at everything, taking in everything around her and processing it. And then she starts. She says, what is that thing? And she says, why do you have two of those things? Why is that girl on the phone all day? What does that guy do? And I said, please, take some markers and go draw something on the whiteboard. <laughs> Which she finally did. A bag of Cheetos won that argument. Um, I went and sat in my office. And I sat there for a minute, and something significantly bothered me. And I stood up, and I said, wait a minute. Why do we have two of those? What is that thing? And why is that girl on the phone all day? <laughs> and I realized something really important. I lost my childlike wonder. I lost the ability to wonder about everything around me because I was busy. We get in our cocoon, right, that we're comfortable. We see the same things every day, so we stop seeing them. And in fact, it gave me a revelation. I went and got my entire management team, and I said, tomorrow I want everybody to come in here and think like a child. I want you to think like a five-year-old. I want you to bring back childlike wonder, and I want you to question everything we do and why we do it. And the results were absolutely phenomenal in the way we completely rethought our business when we rediscovered the fact that it is important, once again, to wonder about everything the way the child does. So a five-year-old child taught me this importance of re-engineering. And I started to realize, when I started meeting, traveling around the world and meeting some of the world's most successful and innovative people, they did the same thing. Only they didn't think of it as a childlike thing. They thought of it as, how could you improve the world any other way if you weren't open to taking in a complete new look all the time? You can't accept everything the way it's always been. The world's most innovative people remove all their filters and open their minds. So that's the first thing. But here comes the big question. Why is this so important? <laughs> I'll tell you why it's so important. Uh, in fact, I'd love you to ask any of these companies on here, but you can't. They're all dead, OK? <laughs> They're all dead, I will conjecture, because they lost the ability to wonder about their business. They stopped reinventing and thinking about what they did, why they did it, and if there was a better way to do it, and they're all gone today. So now your mind is open, and you're saying, OK, Jeff, I'm ready to wonder. What do I wonder about? So here is our second of three points today. I notice that the world's most successful and innovative people don't just wonder about their own domain. We have this bad habit of living this in, in this cocoon and only wondering about the things we do. If you are in healthcare, you spend your day reading and studying healthcare. You go to healthcare shows, you read articles, etc. Whatever industry you're in. So I developed a technique to try to emulate, and I want to share it with you today, what, what, what I notice the most innovative people doing. For lack of a better word, I call this info sponging. What is info sponging? What I do is every morning, I take the first 20 minutes of the day, no emails, no phones, no texts, nothing. For 20 minutes, I leave my industry and leave my company mentally, and I let my mind wander. What do I do? I look at cross-disciplinary things. I go see what they're doing in the banking industry. I go see what they're doing in restaurants and entertainment. 
I look at things that are not in my domain. What am I looking for? I don't know. But you know what I do? I write them down. I write down everything that interests me. You know what else I look at? I look at the Yahoo top 10 trends. What, what are the top 10 searches on Yahoo? What am I looking for? I don't know, but I write it down. Things that say, well, that's interesting. I write all these data points down. I look at new legislation. I look at global events. I just click and let my mind go on things that I would never look at otherwise if I wasn't intentionally info sponging. What do you do with all those things? You write all those data points down. What do I do at the end of the 20 minutes? I hold up that list and I stare at it. And I look at that, and you know what it is a lot of days? Just a bunch of data points that don't mean anything to me. But you know what happens if you do this info sponging, you collect these data points and you write them down every day and you look at them? One day, a picture forms. One day, all the dots start to connect and you say, oh, wait a minute. If you merge this trend with this new technology, with you know, the announcement of these companies doing whatever, all these trends, all these data points start to connect. And that's where innovation happens, because you took a look at a world bigger than, you own, uh, than your own. You made note of what was interesting. And every single day when I look at that list, I say to myself, OK, what can I do today that I couldn't do yesterday? That's the key question you're asking. Gather data from a world bigger than your own, jot it down, and connect the dots. I want to tell you a real quick story. So years ago, I was sitting at a, at a, with a guy named Jay Walker at a company called Walker Digital, and we basically, Jay laid out in front of me on the table a bunch of data points. This is what they looked like. They were points like I just told you. Information about distressed inventory, information about perishable commodities, about soft goods fulfillment, about dynamic pricing, about online consumers. What do all these have to do with each other? Independently and separately, nothing. But you know what we did? We all kept moving the pieces around the table, and guess what came out of it? We launched a company called Priceline.com that today is a $35 billion market cap company. Uh, the stock broke $700 recently. That came from the process of looking at changes in the broader world around you and moving the puzzle pieces around every day until something fit. Here's the last, the third and final point. There's a lot of data out there. People say to me, Jeff, I want to do that. I want to do this info sponging, but I don't know how to filter it. There's too much stuff, as you can see by this statistic behind me. The amount of data in the world is growing at an alarming rate. So I'll give you my third and final point, which is a technique for how to decide what data to look at and what not to. I was uh, meeting with an elderly gentleman one day that I had lunch with, and he's in the retail business. And he was telling me that if you see these two pictures, on one side you see what looks like your typical conference room. It's, it's your MBAs, it's your vice president of sales, your head of market research. It's all the people that are every day telling you all the data and all the information and all the reports and what to listen to. And he said to me, some days they all tell me so much stuff that I get up, I go get in my truck, I drive down to the diner, and guess who I sit with in the diner? My customers, who are not sophisticated, who are not data driven. He says, I go have a piece of apple pie with my customers. And you know how I know what data to filter when I get back? I filter out everything that wasn't important to my customer. I spend a day in their life, and whatever didn't seem relevant to them, may, again, important that it's your customer, that's the data that I separate out. I pull out the data that my customer told me was relevant to their life. By the way, who was that guy? It happened to be a man named Sam Walton, and I think he did it very, very well when he told me the story of having apple pie in the diner with his customers as a method of filtering out a data-intense world. I never lost that lesson. I think it's really, really important for all of us to take that same lesson to heart. So by the way, I'll tell you a technique that I do in my companies now after that lesson. I make a cardboard cutout of my customer and I actually put these cardboard cutouts in the conference room, in my office, everywhere, so that everywhere you are in the office, you never forget that the people that work here in my company don't even represent the customer. You're not even in their demographic. You don't live in their neighborhood. So how are you going to sit in my conference room and design a product for them if you don't live a day in their shoes? It was interesting what happened with this experiment, and now I do it regularly. People would walk into my office and say, Jeff, I got an idea. And I'd say, that's nice, but even though I'm the CEO, you work for Jane, not me. Tell it to her. And they would say, well, she wouldn't understand this. And I'd say, well, then go back and fix it. Simplify it until she would. So it was funny, because at the end, people would walk in my office with a clipboard. They'd look at me, they'd look at Jane, and they'd just make a U-turn without ever <laughs> saying a word. And I said, you know what? Pretty soon, we got pretty darn good at figuring out what was important. Uh, it, what was important was our customer. So in summary, what have I learned sort of traveling the world and, and meeting with a lot of people that have been very successful at what they do? 
a, a couple of key points. I'll just summarize that for you. First of all, harness the power of wonder. Learn to employ that childlike wonder and think like a five-year-old. Question everything deliberately. Even if you only do it once a year, it'll be, you'll be amazed at the results you'll have redesigning your business and refocusing. Second, uh, try info sponging. Take 20 minutes a day, 20 minutes a week. Find some time to leave your industry and visit the world around you that you would never look at if you didn't force yourself to. When you do that, assemble the data points. Write down everything that seems interesting to you. Stare at it at the end of every day and ask yourself this question. What can I do today that I couldn't do yesterday? If 99 days in a row, the answer was, I don't know, and nothing came of it, and the 100th day was your Priceline.com, it's a real good thing you were keeping an eye on the world around you. And then filter your data through the eyes of your customers. I think that that's, uh, again, that's the key to success when you get data overload. You heard today from other speakers that customers want integrity, transparency. If you filter your data and your information through their eyes to make decisions, you will win. And uh, lastly, wear pants. Uh, it doesn't actually help to do this naked, it turns out. Thank you.